Namaha Namo Tassa Bagawato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bagawato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Homage to him, the blessed one, the, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully the enlightened one. one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Yes, we pay homage to him and to the Dhamma. That is what we're about here. Um, let's see, what we are going to be playing with today is, is what kind of terms, and I'm hoping more people will show up. We, I didn't really announce this until late to Venerable, but I want you all to throw out here or put on the chat. I think they can put it on the chat too, can't they? Yeah, or no? Yeah, they could if they wanted to. Um, that terminologies or words that you don't understand that you're confused with or that we use when we're teaching these terms that come up and I hear a lot about them each week. People write to me about different things. And one of the things that has happened is, is mixing up terms and not quite we're not quite clear enough in explaining where these terms fit in, okay? And um, I wish I could draw, but I don't know how to hook that up now. Um, basically, when we're teaching you, we all know we have the term jhana. So if you write down jhana, you have the jhanas, and then what happens is you have there are four jhanas, and then there are four mental jhanas under the fourth jhana. But also, that today we call this eight jhanas, just to confuse you. <laughs> so, so um, the rupa jhanas are the ones that are the ones where you can feel your body completely. And then the mental jhanas, your body basically is gone. It's not part of the story anymore. And you're not in the mental jhanas if you are still worried about your, you're worrying about your mental, uh, the mental level that you're going into or something, but you're concerned about your body. If you say you're concerned about your body, our question is there is no body. So if you're experiencing this set of things, there shouldn't be any body at all. Or, or it should be disappearing. The body starts to disappear in the third, between the third and the fourth jhana. So if uh, we were trying to explain this to you, you know, and, and the jhanas are like, the. I think the easiest way for us to explain the jhanas to you is they're like signposts, okay? Just consider you're on a trip and you're on your way to a destination and there are signs along the way. And these, as I said, the first four signs, one, two, three, and four, those you can feel your body. So we call these rupas, the rupa jhanas, the arupa or the no, the where the body's beginning to disappear, we call infinites. Uh, five, six, seven, and eight are consisting of infinite space, infinite consciousness nothingness and then what I call the big bragger the one at the end is <laughs> neither perception nor non-perception and at probably 85 or 90 percent of the people that talk to me about neither perception or non-perception are not in neither perception or non-perception and the reason is because the way that they're presenting it to us we understand they're not in it is because you can't know that you're in it until you're not in it anymore, if that makes sense, which it doesn't usually. But what happens is you come out of your sitting and you sit there and question yourself. Was I asleep? Was I awake? Did I meditate or did I sleep? What happened just now? Because it's different. It's different. So this is something people don't, um, they don't identify with very well that one, okay. Now, so jhanas are like signs along the way. Let's see if I can complete this little simile here. 
when we're dealing in the mental jhanas, well, let's start this way. When we're dealing in one, two, three, and four, we have a set of markers and that we can we hear about all the time in the text. We hear about these markers. And the markers or hallmarks, if you want to call them, I call them hall hallmarks, that, that indicate that somebody is there is by what's going on, what you're still able to do when you're in the first genre and what is happening when you're in the second and what is happening in the third. And the way you learn about it in the texts, you will learn about it as these pieces that are occurring at first in that jhana, they will, some of them will disappear and new ones will form in the next jhana. And then in the next jhana, other things will fall away and certain things will happen in the next jhana. So this is, this is how um, we, we have these hallmarks in the first four jhanas. Now, one of the things, how I don't know, I can't see you, and so you can't raise your hands, but I need to know who is working with forgiveness or whether we should just have a separate lesson on forgiveness, but everybody wants to do forgiveness, and if you are doing forgiveness, it gets a little complicated because the way that we're practicing in, uh, in, in the uh, TWIM, Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation is different than the way that we're practicing when we move over and we use the forgiveness. But let's stick first with the jhanas. Let me try to, to keep it focused. Um, in, the, in the first jhana, one of the things that's still going on is you still have thinking and examining thoughts. You still have thoughts come up and you can think with them and think about them. You have uh, one of the hallmarks that you've gotten there is the joy comes up naturally and you have to describe that to us. And there is a kind of uh, mm, high level energy that's in this joy, but at the same time, it's surprising because it's a different kind of joy from anything you've discovered before in your life. You don't feel the joy that we're talking about in Meditation is not the same as you experience outside. Okay. When the joy fades away, and it will, that's when tranquility arises. And when tranquility fades away, that's when happiness arises. So these pieces go like PT, and then when it fades away, you have Pasa D, that's your tranquility. When that fades away, you experience Sukha. And Sukha is different than the excitement that was in the first part of this joy, because this Sukha is an internal kind of contentment. That is what Buddhist happiness is. And the... Um, the joy that you're experiencing uh, in the first jhana, when I said it was different, if you want to make a note about this, there's five kinds of joy. And the, uh, the first three types, well, I'll tell you what, let's look here for a minute, see if we can pull that up. So, oops, I don't have that here. What did I do with it? <laughs> okay, I don't have that with me. Um, you have five types of joy. The first type of joy, the first three types, everybody can feel. Okay, so the lay person who's not meditating and the meditators can feel this one. Everybody can. First one is like you have goosebumps, goosebumps that happen. Something happens and you start smiling and this joy comes up and you're just happy, you know, and that lasts for just a few minutes. Okay, the second kind of joy is like, um, a flash of joy. And this is a flash of joy that happens is like, it's not quite like as grand as lightning, but it's a flash that happens. You open the door and somebody just returned from the, from the, from the military and they're there in the doorway. You go, wow, they're there. And it just goes through you and you feel it all through you, but it's only a short burst, a short time, but it's longer than the first one. It's maybe 10 minutes long. 
And the third kind of joy is you are standing in the ocean and the water is up to your waist and the waves are coming and they're just washing over you and washing over you. And this is really, really nice. And this can happen, can keep going for 20 minutes, can even happen for, you know, even longer than that. It's just this perfect coolness coming over you. It's just wonderful, okay? And these three kinds of things anybody can experience. But then when you start to do meditation, you open the doorway to two other kinds of joy. The first kind of joy is a, a joy that comes inside and it's uplifting and you feel it a lot in your head. You feel lighter and very happy. You've never felt like this before. And it's kind of a surprise to most of us. It's been a surprise the first time this comes. And this is PT. Okay, and this comes up and it has a lightness to it and has a kind of excitement and energy in it and it rises up and it's there and then it can be there for a little while while you're in first jhana and then you move on and you go into another jhana. It gets a little stronger, a little more body to it than that. And then that one starts feeling less and less, getting less that happens as it as it's in the second genre. Okay. Now, the last kind of joy is called all pervading joy. And these last two kinds, this one I just described, the PT, and then this mudita, this mudita joy and the enlightenment factor of joy is a much a more internal thing. It's inside you and it goes all through you. And this is the one, if you get this going, you taste it, you know, you can bring it up sometimes. You can bring this up and just walk around in either one of these, the PT or this one. And you're in it with a lot of equanimity. It's really, really nice. Okay. And it keeps going for a while. So these are the five kinds of joy that you can experience that are happening. Now, what we're talking about is the, the jhanas one, two, three, and four. Between three and four, you have what's happening is losing, feeling, beginning to lose touch with the body. And in the fourth jhana, you have this balanced mind, this equanimity we call equanimity, but it's very strong. Four-footed equanimity is there, four-footed, very solid. And you need that balance of equanimity in order to go through the mental part, the mental jhanas. You need this to be established in order for you to, um, to ha have this experience where you can watch the mental states. That's what's important, okay? And you go through infinite space, infinite consciousness, and nothingness. These, these are, we have, we have lots of observation that we can do in infinite space. And this is internal in your mind. Now, when we're talking about the depth of this with when you're in these states, this is where I get tongue tied. Maybe our Dika can help me too. <laughs> Hi, our Dika. Okay. So here, here is the thing that here's the thing that's happening to confuse people. We have the jhanas and the names of the jhanas, one, two, three, four, and then infinite space, infinite co consciousness, nothingness, neither perception or non-perception. But when we're talking to you in your interviews, we're talking about how long you are sitting. And when you get to an hour, an hour and a half or two hours of sitting, we start using more terms, more terms. Like we'll say, um, we'll say uh, mm, quiet mind, quiet mind. And quiet mind is, a, is an example of when you're sitting for a long time in a mental jhana, in quiet mind, nothing is moving around. So we're reminding, our, reminding ourselves, nothing is, nothing is moving around here. We can just watch this realm, watch what's going on. So we're talking about the realms. And these are like, uh, we might say, sit with quiet mind and, and say that it's not a different level. It's a condition we want you to sit in at whatever level you're in, you see? And you're in infinite space, infinite consciousness or nothingness, and you're sitting with quiet mind, we might say to you, quiet mind with a little more energy or quiet mind with 
or bright mind. We might ask you to sit in bright mind. In other words, your mind is not bright enough to all of this, all that we're talking to you about when we're interviewing you is we are trying to uh, encourage the operation of the meditation. The whole time we're teaching you, we're trying to teach you about how to make the meditation operate smoothly and clearly so that you can explain back to us in the same language we're talking, you know, what is going on and exactly how you are doing, okay? And we want you to be able to be able to, uh, to we want you to be able to watch as succinctly as possible, as, as, as precisely as possible, what's going on and be able to, to describe this to the person who's interviewing you. Now, I know this must be really tough if you're using um, a computer form and you're just writing to the teacher and they're just writing back and that's it, okay? But when, when I was doing online retreats, originally when I started the online retreats, I was writing to a person. They were um, writing to me a report. I was writing back to them. And then if I had a question about what they said, I would say, please do and add one, uh, you know, a first, uh, your first, first note at for day one, add note, I would call it an add note. So you got to write to me again to clarify. So we were communicating um, as closely as we could without stopping to see each other. We didn't see each other on Zoom back then. This is 2005. And we had to communicate what we were feeling, what was going on by writing to each other. Rarely, I would call someone on a phone and say, look, I don't understand what you mean when you say, for instance, uh, meditation, or when you say mindfulness. I need to know when people come to us to practice TWIM, uh, they often, they come to us uh, with their idea of what the meditation is about and what it should do. And they come to us with an already preconceived idea of what mindfulness means. And for us, mindfulness is very clear. It's not complicated. Mindfulness is your observation skill. And it's special because this observation skill that we teach you is going to help you to be able to say to us what's going on more precisely, you see? So when we have the jhanas then, and we have the tone, these tone words like quiet mind, and then we might say bright mind, and we might say still mind. And all of this, what we're saying to you where do we get these ideas to say to you in interviews? What you say to us tells us exactly what to say back to you. <laughs> Frustrating, isn't it? Yeah, but that's what is actually going on and trying to explain to a teacher what you say to us tells us exactly what you need and we, need, we say back to you. And sometimes you even tell us even more precisely than precisely. You'll say, I think I might need a little bit more energy. And we'll say, well, first off, you need more energy. There you go. <laughs> the words of the, of the prophet has spoken. But you just told me that, you know, or you say, I'm just so tired. I don't know what to do. I can't meditate. Well, you need to get up and walk. You need to walk and get your energy flowing and get your circulation going. You can't just sit and then say, I'm finished this one and then take a yawn and stretch your feet and say, okay, let's do another one. You should be walking 15 minutes per hour uh, on the ratio of 15 minutes for each hour and no more than 45 minutes, which you're taking a walk at that point. But you know, no more than 45 minutes. We say that we don't tell you anything, by the way. I don't tell you anything that I haven't watched Bonte and I to test with 40, 50, or 100 people first to see what happens if we say this to you or, we, or you're doing this or you're doing that. You see, we don't just say something to you. Everything that we were doing or saying in uh, your interviews 
were very calculated things, which we're going to get into when we talk about forgiveness here a little bit. We need to look a little bit at that, what's happening with that. Okay, but you have jhanas, um, you have the names of them, you have these statements about the deeper mind, which is quiet mind, and now you're 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 using quiet mind, but I need you to make it brighter. I need you to to um, have more stillness in in what you in what you're watching. From what you've said to me, you're you're looking at different places you don't need to be looking. So what should I be looking at, Sister Kama? <laughs> you, you should be looking at a screen inside to start with. To start with is a good place to understand that you can watch things inside. You tell the person to watch, pretend you're going to a movie. And I give you a ticket, it's free. And you say, well, what's playing, Sarah? And Sarah says, I have no idea. Just please go and sit there and watch the screen in front of you and see what happens next. Just see what happens in a dark screen in front of you. You close your eyes and you start watching that way. And pretty quickly, I think people realize that they do have a peripheral vision. They have a side vision when they're watching inside, just the way I have a side vision. I'm not, this is tunnel vision when I come to you like this. <laughs> Okay, this is tunnel vision, <laughs> okay? And I have no side view, but side view, you need side view too, you know? And you have that inside just the way you have it outside. It gives you a broader base of view, okay? Then we might talk to you about the color and the tone of the, or the texture of what it is that's happening in the jhana. You might speak to us that way, or we might speak back to you in terms of that, you know? And the, uh, the um, we're interested in colors. If colors come up, like what color came up, like if it was pink, that's great. You know, pink is like full of energy and you want to move forward and pink, pink light or pink brightness is a very good thing. Red is too much energy. Okay. Too much energy. Green is like, you're going to go to sleep soon. Okay. Okay. Um, blue is a very good one. It's a, it's a higher level one and um, you're violet or your purple is not usually seen but in the deeper levels there might be some kind of a background that's that's a, a purple or a blue and sometimes when you're in quiet mind very very deep uh, when there's somebody who's sitting for uh, like three four hours they'll say I, they come to you it's very interesting they come to you and they say I need to do my interview now um, and they talk to you this loud and no louder at all. And they're so still and so quiet. You have to lean over to see what they're saying sometimes because they haven't moved in four hours. And they'll finish and they'll come over and they'll do their interview. And my favorite story about that sort of thing is a guy came from the East Coast, from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania out to Missouri. And um, I had never, I had experienced this, but I had never seen anybody else experience it in front of me before. And I, my experience of it was quite different from this, but what happened to him, he fell into a state of equanimity, just total, complete equanimity. He reached into a level where there was just no discontent at all. And so he was well into uh, the uh, nothingness, okay? And then he was actually playing with neither perception or non-perception because of what he was answering. And I had never seen anyone answer this way. Bhante said to him, so how's it going? Fine. <laughs> you know, he didn't say anything. And and I was behind behind him writing notes and I watched it from behind. And then Bonte said, Well, what's it is anything happening that's new? It's 
fine. <laughs> you wouldn't say anything except it's fine because it was fine. <laughs> That's what. And afterwards, I said, Bonte, what was that? You know, because he said, well, you're doing fine. Go back and sit. And then I said to him when the guy left the room, what is that? He said, that is equanimity. He's, there's nothing in here anymore. There's no thoughts at all going on. There's no observation besides the observation of what's right here that's happening and if it's nothing you know it's fine <laughs> and so he was trying to get across there's just nothing no aversion to anything and there wasn't anything happening and so this is the kind of experience that you can have when you get into deep deep uh, equanimity so did I did I cover it all, Bunty? I don't know if I covered it all. Is he still here? Yeah, he's here. Okay. Yes. So uh, I think, uh, most of them you're covered. <laughs> so jhana is the signs, and then you have to you want to be able to talk about what's happening, and then you're going to put some more added things in there, and we're going to talk to you about quiet mind, still mind, bright mind, and. And then we might say you need a little more of this or that, but you're the one that's going to tell us what's happening and it tells us what you need. And our only job as a guide, the way that we teach, the only job we have is to see you fall off the track and get you back up on the track and attempt to help you stay on the track for, you know, for 10 days that's it that's all we're trying to do and it's your show it's what you're doing so what we're having trouble with is sometimes if people read the books now it's it's confusing people and it's this is the terrible these books that are coming out now are are rough you know for you if you're not a real experienced meditator and you know just read the book and put it away or and just and just go on with your practice you start trying to guess where you are. And how important is it to guess where you are? It's not important. For the first four jhanas, it's not important at all for you to have to guess precisely where you are when you're first learning and you're attempting to go through the first time. It is not important. But I want it to be important because it's my experience and I'm going to make this happen. This is what's running through your mind and I have to control it and I want to steer it and I want to know exactly where. Forget it. Just forget it. Leave it alone and just, you know, keep going forward. If you want to keep notes in a journal, keep notes in a journal, but don't be thinking about where you are, only about exactly where you are as you're watching. That's all. You don't, you, the whole object of this whole thing, if we were to talk about, uh, let's try this one. What is the meditation for? What is it for? So we have to be able to be on the same wavelength, the same frame, the student and the teacher has to be able to be on the same frame working together on two sides of the frame here's the teacher and here's the student and they're equal they're not like this okay they're equal and the relationship has to be totally honest and it has to be totally just what's going on and you're just talking about the experience that you just came out of okay you don't want to go into anything. Could this be that? Could this be that? Who cares? It has nothing to do with where you're going right now. That's the only thing. And like I said in the beginning, I think the biggest problem is the misunderstanding about what is meditation and what is mindfulness and what, what are these things for when we have banners and signs of things that you're going through. Look at meditation for a minute. And right now in modern times, meditation, what is it? What is it, Ardika? What do you think it is? Meditation. What's it for? Relaxing. Yeah. 
Okay, Sarah, what do you think? It's disclosing, so it, it, it leads us to see things that we don't re realize about ourselves, which are helpful. So it's, it gives us a real no, challenge. Learning, learning about ourselves. Hmm. Who else can tell me? Let's see. What do you think it's about? Benjamin, what do you think it's about? Hi, by the way. <laughs> what do you think it's about? Meditation. That's sister. Um, I believe it's the opportunity for us to be with ourselves, to really understand the self and selflessness in theory. Mm -hmm. I think I'm trying to put that in practice. That's good. That's really good. Okay. Anybody else got ideas? Why do why do people come to the meditation in modern times? Hmm? Terja, do you know? Hi, sister. You just, just what you think. Hmm? Well, we see a, we see a lot of people coming. They need to lower their um, blood pressure. They need to lighten up with less, lower their stress, find ways to help lower their stress. The, um, it's a time to be by yourself. It's a time to examine the self, like Sarah said, and it is a time, um, like uh, Ardika was saying, to investigate and, and Benjamin too, the, the self, and to take a look. And he's right. A lot of people don't see this, you know, uh, about Buddhism, but it's it's examining uh, what life would be like if we were we stay on the defensive all the time. It's very tiring to just go out in the world and decide you have to stay on the defensive all the time. And that's this personally, I have to be there and I have to defend myself like all the time. You see, and why are we in that position? Because we're taking everything so personal and we think it's all, we have to handle it, we have to control it, we have to absolutely take control of everything. Well, you do have to steer, this is true. You're on like a ship and it's your ship through life and you do have to steer it towards the unwholesome or towards the wholesome. This is what we're learning in, in, this, um, in this practice. But more important, we don't want anybody to think we're trying to get rid of the self in the terms that we look at self and no self, sometimes we get confused. But if we look at it as taking things personally or taking things less personally, the self would always wanna take it personally and it's all about me and I have to control it and I have to control my life. That's the one person. The other person, is with uh, the real, the consequence of if there was no self, what would be there? The human being would be there, but they wouldn't be stressed out about defending themselves about anything. They would just be going through the present time and marching along and not carrying uh, the weight of a huge past events and stuff or worried about the future. They would just be here in this present time flow and they would be doing things one at a time. That's a lot less stress. It's a lot less stress, isn't it? So to be kind to ourselves, to be gentle to ourselves, this is what we're learning from, from the practice. This is what we're trying to understand. And so we, we talked about these, these terms and everything and how they uh, we, our understanding of the meditation part you're meditating to understand the nature of how suffering happens. You're, you're going to take an investigation trip. When you work with me, you're gonna take it in an investigation trip. And this investigation is the same one the Buddha was taking. He wanted to see exactly what the suffering is. He wants to see exactly what the cause of it is, whether it's physical or whether it's mental suffering. He wants to see what the cessation of it is like. And then he wants to see, he realizes what 
the cessation, we all realize what the cessation of suffering is. Take a look at some time when you're on the you know, lawn giggling with your kids or you're playing tag and you're just having a really good bright time. There's not this suffering and defense. You're just doing one thing and it's really fun to investigate. Yeah, okay. Now look at that. And without this personally getting, trying to control everything, you're just doing the best you can and playing. He realized, the Buddha realized there were times when people weren't suffering. There was such a thing as cessation. So how do we get to the state of cessation where we're not so concerned and uptight with tension and tightness and struggling? And can it last longer? And that's why he develops the path. He develops the way to expand the happiness you have in the time when you are a cessation. What about happiness? Do you think you can make happiness come? Do you think you can purchase happiness or buy it or have it? Like, get it? Like, where is that happiness? Oh, here it is. I know this is it. Okay, happiness, this particular crystal. Okay, there it is. I've got it. <laughs> No, it doesn't work that way <laughs> because we're also learning about the three characteristics. And one of the characteristics is nothing is there permanently. Everything is changing all the time. So are we learning to be flexible? How flexible? We'll go out into a field and, you know, lay down on a blanket and watch the grass as it blows in the wind and see how it bends. Can you be as bending and as flexible as the grass in the field when the wheat is growing up high before it's harvested? Can you be like this? Or are you going to be like this uh, 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 mm, 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 through life? You see? These little similes, these little pictures come into my mind. I think everybody thinks about these different times in their life, you know. How can this be so hard? How, why it, have you ever been in the situation of why is this happening to me? That's one. Why is this happening to me? Little did we know, because three weeks from now, you'll look back on it and you'll understand everything. <laughs> yeah, but why is this happening to me? The way you see this happening, if you see it as a potential for a lesson for something, and then you allow yourself to get through whatever it is, however it's working, and then you turn around and you see the, the truth of what happened afterwards, you learn something from it. Okay. So all of this stuff is, is a potential for understanding that the use of the meditation, the Buddha wanted us to observe how the mind operates why the mind sister came up why why not the the whole be or the whole shimoli no no why the mind well because everybody at his time was struggling with the body and thinking that the mind would open if we tortured the body or if we did something so all our attention was on the body in one place maybe the mind would open it didn't work. He tried everything. I think we had a class here recently where we described a lot of the things that he did. Yeah, and we looked at all the things. And But what did he do that was so extraordinary? Well, I'm a subject, and here is my object to watch in meditation, or the breath, or the spiritual friend, okay? And he, he all decided maybe there's a different way of handling this instead of just having something out here that is the object, maybe, maybe the subject should become the object. Imagine him sitting under a tree or taking a walk and thinking one day, these people are all crazy what they're doing. We should just look at our own mind. Why? Because the mind is the forerunner of all states. All these states we go through in our life all start here in the mind. So he thinks, why don't we examine the connection between the mind and the body? And that's where the control center must be in the mind. 
And it's, it's actually heart mind. I'm really beginning to believe this very strongly because so many people say to me that you feel when you have a feeling experience, where do you actually feel this first? And most everybody will say first, it's a heart mind, almost like there's a connection, heart and mind in the same moment. If something dreadful happens, the heart aches is the part that hurts. And then if something glorious happens, the heart wants to open and celebrate whatever it is that's happening that's just so great. And so this heart-mind, heart-mind connection is there. But he says you can, you can actually watch consciousnesses and watch how they come up and go away, come up and they always go away. How ideas, you can watch how ideas come up in your mind. They arise, they're there, they exist, they're gone. The origination, they come up, they exist there, watch them, and then they pass away. And it says in 111, the description of our practice, it says there, it was not there, it came up, it is there, it passes away in every level of the meditation, all the way to to seven, all the way to nothingness, okay? So this is an interesting part of it, is looking at that. Okay, so he designs a practice where he tests the easiest way for this to operate and for me to watch it is to watch it with precepts that are operating so nothing distracts me. That's interesting. You keep your precepts, nothing starts to distract you as much as it did before, you see? So that's one thing that happens. So this gets really interesting. So when you're, he's actually asking you to observe the movements of mind, to watch how they move from one thing to another, without you asking him to. Can you watch your mind and notice how things pop into your mind and you let them go? What you can sit there and just watch and boom, you know, let it go, let it go, relax, smile, come back. So he discovers this right effort system and he offers it to the monks and they keep it going for, I don't know, we think they kept it going 150, maybe 200 years after he was gone, but it was so small. Right effort was so small that it was bound to get lost as people started teaching more and more away from the suttas. And when we look back at the impact of the, the big commentary, once people started believing that is the word and that is actually the whole voice of the Buddha and accepting it that way, when that started happening without question, then it, it didn't really have a chance to be around and be remembered. And what happens is, so we get the first and second step of right effort. It happens that you will see something that's a distraction, recognize that you're being pulled away from what you're doing. You'll let go of it and maybe you'll relax but you, that's all you do. Do you change? Does it change anything? And we find out it doesn't change anything unless, unless the um, other two steps of right effort are happening because the first two steps are purifying mind, but that's not enough. You have to replace what was happening with something new, which is positive. And this is the, this is the place uh, I believe that we've fallen down in a lot of our psychology when we when we work with psychology and we only touch the problem and don't do that anymore. But it almost always comes back. It almost always comes back unless we're replacing it and building a new something so that mind can carry on. So that's the the part about the practice. And so in meditation itself, the Buddha says meditation is observing the movements of mind's attention in order to see clearly the four noble truths, 
the answer to the Four Noble Truths, okay? And that's interesting. Okay, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> okay, oops, oops. Oh dear. Hmm. Jeez, okay, I give up. To see, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I have stuff popping up all over my screen and I don't have any idea why. Okay, there it left. I want, I'm simple, I want a computer with no ads. <laughs> I don't think it's possible anymore. And I want a phone that will just be a phone. I could, I, I could, have the biggest, most successful phone company in the universe if I could just make a phone and it would be called Just a Phone. Come and see the most important miracle of the 21st century. A nun far away on a mountain in a cave finally figured out how to please all the women in the world just by starting a company called Just a Phone. It's simple, you dial up Sarah, you get her and you talk to Sarah and you say, hi, how's it going? And that's good and bye. And you hang up the phone. There are no bells, there are no buzzers. There's nothing in front of you. You might even be able to see Sarah, but there's no ads and nothing to buy unless you want to go shopping. <laughs> Computers are supposed to make your life easier. Well, I'm waiting. I'm I'm still waiting. Okay. Okay. Let's do you have any questions about meditation? So meditation was to see the four noble truths, understand them completely, and then see dependent origination so you could see how things were working here and now. Not all 12 links you're going to see. Now, you know, you will eventually if you want to watch all 12 links. But the point is only seven of them are really important. When something's happening, you would see or hear or smell or taste, a contact would happen. And with contact, feeling comes up with feeling, craving comes up with craving, clinging comes up. And then you have habitual reactions that come up, right? And then you grab a habitual reaction and powie, you do it again and again and again. That's what it is. Just keep doing it. You don't know why until we try to explain to you your reactions are all based on the past or on worrying about the future. That's it. If we eliminate those two, by, and this one goes away, we're living in the present time. You should come out with us and walk around and people watch. We go and sit places here that we can people watch. And you can watch the dependent origination happening with people and watch the situations between parents and kids and kids and kids. And oh my goodness, it's fun. And just watch, look, there it is. There's anger. Oh, look, there's jealousy. Oh my, there's greed. <laughs> You know, and you can listen to people and hear all this happening in, in, in the cluster of humanity. And you can see what the Buddha was touching base with. And he's watching the deep, this, these pieces of dependent origination in the present life here. And that's even included in the map in the back of the Vasudhi Maga on the last page, there's a section there that shows you those seven links from here to here. And that's in the present time life. So it's not like they didn't think of it at all. It's there right in the book, okay? So we need to understand the four noble truths, dependent origin. And the last one is the three characteristics. Now, how do you see the three characteristics when you're learning about dependent origination. You have to see how everything's changing all the time. Are you watching that in your practice? Are you seeing anicca happen in your practice every cycle that you do? That's anicca. Next one, suffering, the dukkha. 
Do you understand the suffering? Do you understand the heart of the suffering where the tension arises and turns into more stress and tightness and is pulling at you and has to pull you into an I like or I don't like situation that goes to I want it or I don't want it and pulls you towards attachment or aversion. You want to hold on to it and get it or you want to push it away and change it and stop it. You see, that's your suffering. And ananda. And what is anatta? Anatta is the way out. It's the way of letting go and going out of the suffering to embrace an anatta perspective. Not this is about me, it is mine, and it's myself practicing. This is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. This is not who I am. This is just what is happening in the present time. Remembering to bring that up and practice it. This is not me, this is not mine, this is not who I am. This is not myself. This is just my eye operating, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind operating. It's something that's arising, existing, and passing away. It's all tied together. It's all an interwoven dhamma cloth, all tied together. So those are what you're trying to learn. The Four Noble Truths dependent origination and the three characteristics. And they're all there in the practice. Every time we practice, it's there. Okay, now let's look at forgiveness for a minute because that's where a lot of questions come up. Try to remember the points that are the most important for the forgiveness meditation. First of all, when you're going to do forgiveness meditation, just sit down and do it. Jeez. You don't have to check your whole body and calm down and plan the whole thing and everything. Just decide, I'm going to practice this forgiveness. I want you to do that for me. You don't have to take five or 10 minutes before you start, because actually that's a long enough period of time to decide you're not going to do it. <laughs> it is five or 10 minutes of preparation, sitting there and getting comfortable and checking everything in your body to make sure you're completely relaxed before you do this. And you know what? I wasn't relaxed when I started doing it and I ended up doing it for six months. And I'll tell you what, it's, it's work. It's not a simple meditation, but it's worth it. It's really worth it when it works. It's really, really worth it, but you have to remember some things about it. So number one, you're just going to sit down and do it. No, uh, check everybody, check any feeling in my body, check this, check that, check this. It's not an airplane. It's not an ultralight plane that you have to check 128 cotter pins before you take off to make sure they're holding the plane together. <laughs> okay. You don't have to do that. So you're just going to sit down to do it. Number two, you're going to only stay in the first jhana when you're practicing this. This is not the same as loving kindness. It is not part of the loving kindness meditation. It is a tool to help you that you can use any time in your life. And it is a tool that we can use if we have a blockage in letting the meta come up. And the problem with meta coming up for us sometimes is we don't love ourselves. And sometimes we have to back up and see what is keeping us from loving ourselves. Okay, so first you sit down. Number two, you're going to stay in the first jhana when you do this. Why am I going to stay in the first jhana, Sister Kama? Because you need to be able to do thinking and examining while you're in this one. Now, you see, that's very different, isn't it, from the metta? Very different, isn't it? 
you need to think and examine. And we actually want you to stop thinking and examining and go through one, two, three, four jhanas. Okay. So now I'm saying to you, so this is not the same practice. I want to be, be sure you understand this is not part of the same practice. This is a tool we're going to use to balance ourselves to be able to do metta more smoothly. So when you sit down, you're going to stay in the first jhana because you need thinking and examining, yeah, to be able to function. That's your vitaka vichara, thinking and examining. But it's a quick examining, very quick. I'll show you where it is, okay? Now, when if you were given the instructions for loving kindness, you'll find out that we give you uh, a um, little square or a list of about 10 uh, phrases that we've developed over the years. But the first two phrases are the most effective phrases to say. They are the most successful ones. That's why they're number one and two. I guess you couldn't figure that out. Okay. So one and two are the most important. Now let's get things straight here. We are not going to say this one, then say that one, then say this one, then say that one, then say this one, then say that one, and just see what happens, see what happens, see what happens. We're not going to do that. We're going to take one phrase. The first one is the best one. I forgive myself for not understanding things clearly. Boy, did you get in hot water because of what you did a few years ago because you reacted and you didn't even know what was going on. Everybody has some event like that in their history where you reacted and behaved the, just the wrong way or did something crazy and you didn't even really understand totally what was going on and you didn't say anything about it. Afterwards, you just let it go in there and fester like a sore and and then now it's in the way because you feel guilty restlessness guilt and remorse will come up because of this you see because it's stuck inside okay now so i would say when you sit down and you're going to do this you, you're going to take the first phrase i forgive myself for not understanding things clearly pause Please put that in parentheses. Let it sink in your brain. And then you say it again. I really do forgive myself for not understanding things clearly. You really do. And then pause again. And then say, I really do forgive myself. Now, why are we going to do this? Okay, your brain has a lot of responsibilities for your body. If we talk to a brain, a brain man, like I, I had us worked under a chief uh, medical person who was had brains in the cellar of the place where he was teaching people about brains. Okay, he was a brain specialist. Okay, now your brain has a lot of things it does for your body. It helps in all your organs. It helps the operation of your skin, everything in your body that is considered an organ. It has something to do with it. And it's very busy. And it also has a room in the control room up here that's here behind your eyes. There's a control room. The windows are the windows to the control room are your eyes. Okay. But in there, there's a little compartment where there's some people working. And those people are on the protection department. Now, the people who are working in your brain in the protection department are supposed to protect you from going into shock and from suffering in an accident where you would go into shock and you would die. And this protection group helps you by shutting down the brain with what's going on at that moment. And you don't die, but later on you suffer from PTSD. Now, when you're suffering from the PTSD, this is because you shut it off and locked it in place, but it's not you that did this. It's your brain that actually did it. It's not your fault. But now later on, it's okay for you to look at it now because physically you're all right. And so you can look at it now. 
and you're not going to go into shock because it's not here. It's not now. You're reliving it, that sort of thing. And you can take a look at it and understand it's in the past. It's done. It's finished. And I went through that. And then you have to get yourself to come back into balance so that you can get to where you are able to function again here and move forward in life. Now, when you're practicing forgiveness, that's why those things are locked up inside of you. So when you're beginning to practice forgiveness, your brain does not understand why you're doing this. It doesn't understand because oh, your whole life, it could be 25 years, it could be 50 years like it was with me. And you never looked at these things really closely. So you, you left them tucked away, locked up tight, these things that had happened to you, the things that you had gone through, the people, the incidents, everything, you left it. And you never wanted to look at it again. But it's your brain that's making you just keep it locked up until something happens where you are re-stimulated. And then it comes to the surface. Now we're going to invite this to come to the surface. Re-stimulation is an accidental re-stimulation is what happens when somebody acts out, uh, out of, of a huge amount of fear suddenly and they're in the middle of the shopping center and they're suffering from a PTSD coming to the surface. What happened to them is they heard something or they smelled something or they saw a color or they heard, or they, uh, they uh, touched something. They may have just touched a piece of cloth in a store and it shot this memory up, shocked it up to the surface. This is what's happening. Re-stimulation is a real thing, it can happen to anyone. Well, when you're practicing with loving kindness, you are opening the gates. This is why I say you're very courageous if you're practicing forgiveness, because you're going to let things come to the surface. But you might have to convince your brain to allow this to happen. And this is kind of interesting because the way I had to deal with it, and a lot of my students have done this the same as I did it, was we have to pretend, we discover, we have to discover for ourselves, not pretend, but discover that our brain is about two years old, <laughs> you know, and you have to just really, you have to negotiate with it. You have to talk to it like a little child, take a walk and talk to your brain and say, it's okay for me to look at this now. It's okay for me to do forgiveness. I haven't done it before, but I want to understand. And I'm an adult now and I can handle this. I want to know how things really operate. And you have to convince your brain it's okay. And once your brain trusts you, well, I guess I could let her look at that. Maybe I could let that come up just to see what would happen. After all, I'm here. I could let her look at that incident again, maybe. And then somebody will pop up, you see. And when that person comes up, this is where it's different. This practice, we do not 6R everything that comes up, okay? So you have to make friends with your brain. That's one of the things you have to make, make your brain trust you, make your brain trust you, I suppose would be the third thing, trust you. Okay, that it's okay, that forgiveness is okay. Okay. And then number four, when something comes up, you simply, a person, this is going to be an event that pops, comes up into your mind, an event that happened, or there will always be a person in the event, or it could be just one person comes up. A lot of times it's one person. Sometimes an event will come up and it got kind of confusing because the student called me and said, wait a second, there's six people in this event. What do I do? <laughs> Have a group party? <laughs> you know, I said, no, you do. Just think of the event. 
Who is the most important person? Oh, Jack was. Well, then that's the person. And you might need to work with the other people, but most of the time it's going to be the person that just comes in your mind first. This person was the most important, okay? If it's a group. But most of the time it will be a person. So a person pops up. And when the person comes up, you don't want a six R the moment that happens. You know, here's a six R, the person comes up out here and you're forgiving yourself, even if you're involved, even if you're crying, even what they're doing when that person pops you, go away, I'm working. <laughs> if you keep doing that, you're never gonna get to level two. You're never gonna get to level two. What's level two? <laughs> okay, forgiveness has three levels. Forgiveness has is actually a dana practice. This is a dana practice. That's the first one thing I want you to understand. It's a practice of generosity. Number one, you are going to give to yourself forgiveness. That's generosity, isn't it? Number two, you are going to give generosity to another person. That's generosity, right? When you forgive the other person, that's generosity, okay? The other. And number three, this is tricky, listen. Number three, when you forgive the other person, when they forgive you, you're going to accept the, their forgiveness. And when you accept their forgiveness, this is generosity towards that other person. You understand? Okay. It is generosity of you is accepting their forgiveness. It's good for you, but it's, it's kind to them that you are forgiving them. Have you ever had somebody where you you know, you thank them profusely for helping you with something while you were gone, there was a storm and they cleaned up your yard and you, you thanked them profusely, but they said, oh, that's nothing. We would do that for anybody. We were glad we could do it. And then when they're away and you clean up their yard, they get really angry at you for putting things away in the wrong place. <laughs> This is not funny. You know, they don't want to accept your generosity when you try to give back to them. That happens. That happens. And it's no good because you need to be accepted as someone who is accepting from them. You need to be allowed to do generosity for someone. So you're being kind to them. So the kindness, the forgiveness is the kindness is to accept their forgiveness. So these are the four levels you go through. In order for you to get from the first level where you are sending forgiveness to yourself, when someone pops up, you cross the line and now you're in level two, you're forgiving that person. And then what's going to happen if you stay with it? If you continue to do it very sincerely, very honestly, you have to be sincere in this or don't bother trying it. It's not a joke, it won't work, okay? Um, when you're sincerely forgiving that person, they will, they will forgive you. And when they forgive you, they might look, you, look at you. And when they look at you, that's when you look at them straight in the eye. You don't try to look at the person straight in the eye when they first come up and you're working on them. Don't do that because it won't, you know, things happen. You, you have to figure it out for yourself. But if you try to say, look at me, look at me, they're just showing up. Just a lot of times they'll be looking down at their feet. They'll be sort of pretending you're not there or they'll seem to look at you, but they won't respond or they'll even turn their back and they won't walk away, but they'll turn their back and stand there with their back towards you. Yeah. Okay. Now, when they forgive you, what does that mean? It means you accept their forgiveness. And what they do is they might just like this to you. They're not going to speak to you usually. 
they're going to mo- I've never had anybody say they spoke to them. But they'll look right at you and you look them right in the eye and you smile back and it's a really great feeling and you feel it's real. It, it's in your mind's eye, but it's stuck in your heart at the same time. You're forgiving them. They're forgiving you. Let it go. It's all hypothetical. It's all for you. This is happening. But many times, the next time you see that person, they will not have an aversion to you and you won't have an aversion to them. So when you're doing this, they will look at you and smile or they will just um, they will just um, make a motion and you'll feel an overwhelming feeling that something fell off. And sometimes they'll turn around and walk away or you just feel so happy you break the sitting and get up and run and say, it worked. I can't believe how I feel. I feel like a ton just went off me, fell completely off me. It's just clean as a whistle. That's when it's over with that person, not before. Okay. That's how that works up. Now, during the time you are working on the person to forgive them, once that person comes up, there are a set of rules that you must understand. You're going to break your sitting. We tell you in the beginning, just sit one hour at a time. When you start with this, one hour at a time. When you're first starting the practice. But once you have somebody come up, it changes. When your person comes up and you break your sitting, um, if you break your sitting and take a walk, you just... Send a forgiveness to yourself while you're walking, but you can keep the person with you and still continue to forgive them if you want to. But when you come back to sit again, you don't start at the beginning. You don't go back to the beginning. You pick up where you left off with that person and you just keep practicing. So if you stop your practice, when you come back, you pick up again with the same person. Remember that. You don't do anything like go back to the beginning, start to send it to yourself again. Now, when you're through with this person, this could be a number of times you have to work with them sometimes. And depending on how difficult the situation was, if it's a serious situation that occurred, It might come back again in the future after you forgave the person. So what do you do with that? You just handle it again. But when it comes back, it will not be back as difficult as it was in the beginning at all. It gets less strong, less strong, less strong. But to really work with this practice, you leave your meditation alone. Any other meditation doesn't exist. This is the only one you're practicing. You don't do breath. You don't do... Uh, Meta, you just do this. You turn yourself over to this program and you clean the rubbish out. That's what Bhante used to call it. You clean the rubbish out. It's time to dump it all. And you don't try to control this. You don't ever make a list and say to me, I say to you, how did it go? And you say to me, oh, it's fine. I forgave everybody. (laughs) And I say to you, what does that mean? I made a list of 35 people and I forgave them one at a time. I forgave every one of them. Did they forgive you? No, no. Did you forgive yourself? No. Why would I do that? I've never done anything wrong. Did the person do forgiveness? No. Haven't got a clue. Haven't got any idea what the forgiveness was about. If that's what happened with the person, it's my fault or it's your fault if you're teaching them because that's not supposed to happen, okay? It's not about something you're just doing. You're forgiving yourself and then the other person and then you're waiting till they forgive you. That's the circle that was created by Bhante. This didn't come from 
any place uh, like directly in the text, but what we do know is you cannot succeed with Buddhism unless you practice forgiveness. Well, how can I say that, okay? It is in every puja ceremony you ever did. Starts out, kaye no wacha chitena, and then it has the rest of the phrase. And you're asking the monk, forgive me for anything I've done wrong this week, any precept I have broken. You're asking the monk to forgive you. It's in every single service. How can you say there's no forgiveness in, in, uh, in Buddhism? That's just silly. What do you think? We just go like this to the people? Eh, okay, we dumped that one. Eh, there's the other one. Let's throw that out. <laughs> no, you have to. Why, why is it happening that you want to do forgiveness? What is it that comes up that persuades you that you want to do forgiveness? You get stuck. And you can't have loving kindness come up for yourself because you don't like yourself. Why don't you like yourself? Because you have not forgiven things you have done yourself or what has happened with other people. That's why. So the question is, why not try this? Because if you can't run the meditation smoothly and reach the path and go down smoothly, and then experience going through, well, then the texts are not true. They're all a big lie. There you go. They're not real. That's what you want to say? Okay, but that's not what we said. <laughs> you know, we tested them. These texts are real. These texts are true. These texts are still functional and they all work. But just because we mixed up a few things here and there, and there are a few words that got us caught, you know, in a few places that we've changed around and it's not working, that doesn't mean that we get to make up stories about this whole thing and say, well, there is no forgiveness in meditation, in, in Buddhism. That's ridiculous. Of course there is. How can you be loving and kind and compassionate if you're carrying this inside of you? And why did you want to do the forgiveness? Because you felt like you couldn't honestly for real, do the loving kindness and send it out because you didn't have it for yourself. And it usually clogs up in the person in the retreat within the first three days. It's not going to usually pop up five, six, seven days into there like that. It's usually within the first three days we can see the person is having trouble sending the loving kindness to themselves. And the moment they try to send it, the heart won't allow you to send it because it isn't real. And the heart knows it's not real. And the heart doesn't want to send it if it's not real. So when I say to you that you are courageous, when I say to my students, you are courageous because you're doing meditation, you are courageous because you are opening up. You're permitting yourself to open up. I remember the first or second retreat I did, it was in Indonesia and I came out to give a Dhamma talk and I, I had run into this feeling in the heart. These people are so brave. They're really trying. And this one group was really trying hard to actually do this sincerely and do it the right way. And I saw what was coming up and what they were having to forgive and what they were going through. And it just brought tears to my eyes because that's courage, real courage to look at yourself. There's not that much courage involved in looking at someone else and deciding and just saying what they are and everything else. But to, to look in yourself, that takes courage. So this is what this is all about. Now I'm going to throw it open for comments with about 10 minutes here, and then we're going to quit. So we've covered a lot of stuff today, but you get it about you only want to be in the first jhana. You only want to sit for an hour when you first start out. When you sit down in forgiveness, you don't want to, you know, spend a whole lot of time before you let the horse out of the gate. <laughs> you can see putting, I mean, you just see a racehorse, you put him inside that that gate and you say, okay, we got to keep them in there for 10 minutes 
let's massage their legs and check their whole body and see if they're ready to run before we push the buzzer. I don't think that's going to work. You have told your mind you're going to forgive. So just sit down and do the work. Oh, one last thing. This is a different practice because um, in metta, you work to bring up the feeling of loving kindness, the feeling of, uh, you know, of, of loving kindness for yourself. You're working with a feeling, bringing up a feeling. You're not bringing up a feeling when you are practicing forgiveness. The feeling of forgiveness is when you're forgiven. It's the feeling of relief that washes over you that is what's so fantastic. And then you can go out and work with people and you have felt this release happen. That's the feeling that is the big feeling deal in forgiveness. So what do I start with? What I start with is the intention to forgive you it's like saying an affirmation i'm going to forgive myself i'm going to do it honestly i'm going to do it truly and then sit down you want to do that that's fine and then you you start to the intention for this practice is to do forgiveness and nothing else so you don't break because you're beginning to cry and go do loving kindness to yourself if you cry, it's a really great thing. <laughs> they designed these holes in your eyes. See, they're right there, right there. And everybody's got them. And those are pressure valves. And you need to exercise them. Let yourself cry. I'm not kidding. Let yourself cry. And then at the end, if somebody didn't come up, it doesn't mean anything. Go again and do it. But don't you change your, um, your um, phrase that you're using. If somebody came up, you keep using it. And don't give up after one day and think, well, I've got to see if this one works or that one works. Don't be doing that stuff. If you want to check a phrase out, spend three days with it. Two days at least, two days. Earnestly doing it to see if it works. But most of the time, that first one will work. And the second one is, I forgive myself for causing pain to anyone else and myself. To myself or anyone else. I, forget, I forgive myself for causing pain for myself or anyone else. But don't play with all these phrases. And you can make up a phrase too, I'll tell you that but you can't have anything negative in it. Like I forgive myself for being the stupidest kid of the six of us. No, no, no. <laughs> or, you know, you can't do that. You have to run your phrase to in front of our Dika first. Call our Dika and ask him, is this phrase putting me down? <laughs> I forgive myself for being the poorest, no good worker in this family. You know, no, don't do that. <laughs> Just have somebody listen to it because you don't hear it yourself. Okay, questions. Anybody? Ah, okay. You's here. Yeah. Uh, uh, hello, Sister Gima. Uh, thank you for, uh, for the talk. Um, I've got I've got a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, um, is it always uh, forgiveness, <laughs> as it were, for an event, a a, a situation? Could it be forgiveness for an oops frozen. We're frozen? I think the second phrase might be we didn't we didn't hear you because you froze. Could it be? Um, and that's all we got. <laughs> the, um, the, the suggestion is that uh, or, or 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 the examples given are, are about forgiving um, myself for uh, an event, for a circumstance or whatever. Um, but I think that Pat says quite often, um, forgiveness required, if you like, for an attitude. So an attitude might be um, uh, not, not thinking that we're worthless or worth, worth uh, um, uh, um, some, some, something or other. 
Um, and so there's a continuity of attitude over a many different <clears throat> events. You can't forgive yourself for, like, say what you said again, you can't forgive yourself that way, but you can use, there's a very famous one that has cut several people free. And that one is, um, I forgive myself for never allowing myself to just be. You can't mm -hmm. pinpoint a, a bad attitude and stuff like that. That's a different, it's a different page. You know, yeah. I forgive myself for uh, not allowing myself to just be, and this comes from being growing up with the famous stage mother who wanted you to be the most famous actress in the world, you know, and stuff like that. And you were taught from the time you were three, you were schooled in your elocution and your walk and everything, and you never got to play and you never got to do anything but what your mother wanted you to be. And it's a, not, it can be mother or father, or like you never got to do anything but play tennis and your father drilled it into you or golf or something where you were taken by the parents and you were created by the parents. And you get to an age where you lost your entire childhood and you never even knew what it was to be a child because you were always taken away from other children and drilled like this. Or the per person who's been thinking their whole life this stretches over into um, um, think as a perfectionist, not just as a person in sports or painting or music, but also what happens is that they can't even do anything in their life unless it's perfect. The perfectionist really suffers. And most of the time, the perfectionism was not that individual person's uh, problem it's not it's almost like the OCD that was not born in the person but was forced upon the person is in their childhood and they're stuck with it and they think they can never change but they have to see it and see the root of it and then they have to forgive that person that pops up who was at the heart of this and it will pop up and if a person has an attitude like I'm not good enough or something it came from something yeah so if you know if I say I forgive myself uh, for um, see so you say I forgive myself for not being perfect flips over on you and you're not perfect. Yes. These are what we tried and we found out they failed. Yes. Okay. Yeah. When I'm talking about this, okay. And so if I say I forgive myself for not being good enough. That's a put down. You see, Ardika. So if somebody says that's the phrase I want to use, it's no good because it'll 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 boomerang back on the person. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't figure out why because we thought it would be okay, but it just doesn't work. Something in the brain, you know. Um, and if you're not good enough, what you could do is if they want it, you've heard them say they wanted to do that. Well, you say, well, I forgive myself uh, for for uh, causing pain and suffering to myself and anyone else, because there was a lot of pain and suffering for you to try, 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 try to be something you were not. You see? Yeah. And, oh, and, and those people, the people who were involved in that in your life are the ones who are going to pop, start popping up from the beginning, your grandmother and then your mother and then your aunt. And, you know, these people are going to pop up. And those are the people you're going to end up working in. There's going to be other people involved in it. That's what we found out about it. But if you try to nail it onto, I forgive myself for um, not being the best speaker or I can't speak in public or stuff like that, uh, then you just have to be really careful when you say a negative. That's all I can tell you. If you're experimenting with it, you'll see. And, and and where, because I, I mean, some of that applies to myself, which is great, but I've also got a, a client who was under considerable um, cultural um, uh, restrictions on how they could express themselves when they were <laughs> Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and, and, oh, yeah. and so uh, there's a, a feeling there of a whole area of themselves that was unexplored. Well, they have a lot of resentment and all those people that did that, they're gonna come now. And then 
What that's a perfect example of someone for I forgive myself for never allowing myself to just be. They're an adult now and they can allow themselves to just be and then practicing just being who they yeah. are, just being without any restrictions. Go cool. away in the woods. I mean, <laughs> I had someone who said, you know, I never said this word. Um, it's it's S. <laughs> <laughs> it's the delicate situation here. <laughs> you know, I never said this word. The person said, I never said this word, S H I T. And so she immediately started screaming it six or seven or eight times in a row. And she said, Oh, that felt so good. <laughs> I said, Next time you can go out in the forest and do that. Okay. <laughs> Nobody cares out there. <laughs> but she had never been allowed to express herself at all in certain situations, just naturally. And, and she had to work through it. And she started camping with a friend of mine. And they had lots of situations where that was very appropriate. <laughs> you know, and camping is a good experience where that can happen. You know, like I didn't bring the, uh, what is it? The, bring the thing that strikes the flame. And you thought I was so good at that, that you didn't bring the matches. <laughs> and here we are with the tent and we have no way to do this. Yeah, some really funny stories about that. <laughs> um, okay. Um, well, yes, <laughs> another question I have is uh, presentations or, or experience of loving kindness. I mean, you, you, you said that uh, the forgiveness is very helpful when people find it difficult to express loving kindness towards themselves. But what about the scale, the, the range of expressions of loving kindness, which, which are appropriate? Because I think we can all imagine some, some sort of effusive pre presentation of loving kindness, which is, which is very dynamic. But well, I said expressing loving kindness to myself is where this, that yeah. gets caught. That's where it gets caught. See? Yeah. But I, but th that might be um, so. But Bandy sometimes describes this as you know a warm, glowing feeling in your heart. But I think other other people can experience this perhaps in different con in different uh, descriptions. Well, it brings uh, up a story of two guys I was teaching in Panama by the Panama Canal, who insisted that when their their loving kindness was working spectacularly well, and I said, "So how is the loving kindness working? It's very warm, isn't it?" He said, "Oh no." When our loving kindness comes up, it's ice cold and it's wonderful. <laughs> and I mean, they were dealing with like, you know, 42, 43 degrees centigrade weather and they were in humid, like beyond, beyond anything. They said, no, no, no. Our beautiful feeling inside is cold. And I went running to Bonte and I said, okay, okay, what about this? And he said, perfect, perfect. If that's um, what they're um, telling you and they're uh, smiling. <laughs> uh, and what about, because uh, uh, another example, certainly in my experience in the past, um, I've had a smile, but I haven't had something that I would call, um, you know, a cool or a warm glowing feeling, but I've had a, I've had a, 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 a free, a freely expressed smile. Well, then that's fine, because the correction for this when it can't come up uh, easily the way we're describing it here in the in the chest when it's not coming up here okay um, then what we're saying to you is if, if if that's going to sustain it so that you can send the wish to someone else then that's fine because the first thing we'll tell you is okay then I want you to smile smile more you tell them smile more mm -hmm. the smile will go in the right place because it of what it does to the brain, it will correct itself. That's a fine one, yeah. And and so in, in that in that respect, um, uh, when it comes to to sharing, um, it's it, it's less um, it feels less dynamic than um, something which might be more more energetic uh, but that doesn't well, seem to sharing, the sharing part sharing part in the beginning of it is like if smiling is if, if you're if you're feeling good inside and you're smiling 
and yeah. you're wishing someone else to smile. We go down to the seaside where people are just all over the place, especially on Sundays. And we walk around and we smile at people and we behave like teenagers. We're all having fun seeing what will happen. And um, this big, huge guy who's, uh, you know, about a foot and a half taller than me, and he's a heavy Swedish build, you know, wears a pink t-shirt with a great big smiley face on it, and goes up to somebody and goes, yeah, hi, you like the seaside? And, and they just smile. Everybody starts smiling. We're instigating smiling. We're testing out how this works. And they're practicing determinations by um, going down and staying in the first jhana or the second jhana. And then when they're practicing sitting in the, uh, in the restaurants in third jhana and fourth jhana without their body to see what would happen if they were without their body, can they still function? And one of them can run around with no body. It's really fun. It's really fun to watch him because he's like, just like a little kid, you know, and these are like grown men, you know, and they're absolutely crazy. But the interest was what will happen if we do this? And this is the perfect environment to, to uh, test this around all these restaurants and stuff. And just people just love it. I mean, they're so ready to just smile, you know, <laughs> you know, and to see somebody like uh, Pierre go around and do this is really fun. <laughs> this is fun to watch him do it. I didn't think he'd really do it, but he really did. And once he started doing, he says, I'm not going to stop. I just like it, you know? So if somebody's, uh, the other thing I was teaching them how you could, if somebody was upset, you know, in a group of people were upset in some way, you get in the vicinity, you're not real close to them, but you just can be off the sidewalk on the other side. And just uh, can you uh, energize your loving kindness or, or your Karuna? Can you energize that far enough and you can, because that's not across that little street area is not 500 feet. Maybe, maybe it's 50 or 80 feet. And, and if three of them are doing that, then those people cannot be angry anymore. Just like when Bonte put us on the bus on uh, Monday morning and told us to sit in the back of the bus in Washington, people, he said, don't worry, people will get on the bus on Monday morning, they always get on the bus, and they're fighting with each other in the front section of the bus, because they're so angry that they have to go to work on Monday morning. And you sit in the back seat of the bus, just sit back there with a hat on that's kind of down, but you can see, you can watch, and you start sending loving kindness and just smiling. And um, we're not laughing out loud or anything. So if you want to go see the Bodhisattva train, go on your internet and get the short film Bodhisattva train and watch that. But we're not laughing out loud. We're just getting, we're just smiling on the verge of laughing, you know, and, and smiling and sending this into the bus and everybody starts smiling and everybody starts calming down. It's just so much fun. So this stuff is real, but it's not, I don't intend for you to believe me that it's real. It is real that you have to test it for yourself, you know, to see what fun it can be. Was there anything else? Oh, yeah, one other thing was uh, in the earlier part of your talk, you were talking about uh, the Takra Pachara, um, um, the initial thought and sustained thought or uh, initial thought and investigation. Mm -hmm. um, and I was listening to a, a talk by Delson uh, a, a few days ago, and he described the Takapachara as uh, bringing up the feeling of loving kindness and staying with it, which, which reminded me very much of a sort of like a Mahasi approach of holding the object of attention in, in your mind's eye and persisting with that process. And your description here, I, I think, is more, more flexible. Uh, than that, which is that there, there is a discussion in the mind. There is it, it sees it sees events and then it and then it describes or discusses those events unless you notice that process and come back. Um, would that would that interpretation be uh, what you'd agree with or or not? Well, he's just encouraging you to sustain it in what he's yeah, actually talking about. He's He's talking about sustaining the feeling of loving kindness. Yeah, and he's, and he's, um, how do I say it? Um, let me see. He's, um, hmm. 
when we talk about the first jhana where i was talking about it you know where i was talking about it in the first jhana is like that exists as thinking and examining thought is there and you can do it. It, it it gets in the way a little bit and then the second jhana it goes it goes away it starts to go away okay and when i was pointing out to you with uh with uh forgiveness when i was talking about thinking and examining in the first jhana you the reason we ask you to stay in the first jhana when you're practicing uh forgiveness is so that when somebody comes up you can that's the vitaka and Vichara, you have to say, is that a person or can, is this, what, what are the thoughts that come up in forgiveness where you would six are, are the ones that are trying to stop you from doing forgiveness. Yeah. Yeah. And there, your mind, I told you, your mind, my, I, I never quite say this in the all together in the same place, quite right. But um, your mind is leery is is questioning whether it's okay for you to do forgiveness which i did talk to you about okay yeah. and you need this thinking and examining potential there in your mind working in in forgiveness in the first jhana so that you can tell is this something i should just let go of you see yeah. and then you do 6r and and stay with forgiveness you see yeah. That's what I'm concerned about with thinking and examining. When he says with, with loving kindness, when you bring up the feeling and you sustain it, yeah, you can sustain it. But the thing is, it should be an effortless thing that it is being sustained, if you can get what I mean. Uh, yes, you see, exactly. you, you do not want to have any pressure on the brain at all. And see, he and I need to do have another long conversation about this a little bit, because because mm -hmm. if you're if it's when we say things, we say them the best we can when we try to say them. OK, when people hear them, we don't know what they're going to decide it means. That's the danger in in life, in, no, in communication. And so when I say that to a group of people who are practicing TWIM, like Ardika would know what that means if we just said it the way you said it. You see, yeah. he would know what you meant. If Delson said it to Ardika, he would know what, he's, what he really means. Sustain yeah. it, you know, bring up the feeling of loving kindness and sustain it. But he wouldn't put any pressure on it. But if a new person is just starting out and you say, bring it up and sustain it, they're going to say, I have to hold it there. I have to make it be there. And where we do agree with each other entirely in this practice, Jelson and I totally agree with each other. The whole entire experience is an experience of renunciation and cessation. Yes. The whole thing is from the beginning all the way to where you experience uh, cessation and going coming out and experiencing Nibbana, okay? And so in that sense, you don't want to do anything counter to ceasing the tension and tightness that is in the practice. You don't want to make any more tension and tightness. So this is not a practice of doing. You see, when I say this, I'm sort of countering what, it, what you said he said, okay? This yeah, yeah, is yeah. not a practice of doing. This is a practice of allowing yeah, I agree and seeing that. what will happen, okay? And in that respect, it's totally counter from the modern, uh, the modern interpretation of I have to make the hindrance stop when the truth is you need to leave it alone and learn how it works, <laughs> you know, and stop feeding it and it will just go away. You see, so it's it's not, yeah, that's all I can say about it, I think. That's fine, that. that's fine. Yeah, okay. thank you very much. Thank you. Do you, anybody else have a question before we go? Hmm? Avinash. Hi, Vinash. how are you? We are not able to hear you. Oh, he, he, he's not on mute. Has he have a have to, uh, select the audio? Hit, take audio the uh, ear, earplugs out. Uh, hi, my sister. Uh, can, can you hear me? Now? Hi. 
Yes. Hi. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, I want to uh, ask, uh, you are saying uh, in Arupa, uh, body uh, disappearing, uh, disappearing experience. So, uh, I mean, in meditation, I mean, I can feel the uh, mind like flickering. And after that, the mind become very quiet. I mean, right. thoughts become Good. very like coming very slowly. But uh, habitually, habitually, I go to the uh, body examination and I can still hear, uh, I can still uh, able to feel my hands. I mean, uh, that's habit I got from my previous uh, practice, like uh, just, Goenka style. Just like, a, just like go of it. When you say Bhante, just let go of it. You have to let go of anything to do with the body at all. Let go of it. That's one of the reasons I said, you know, when you're starting, when whenever you're starting forgiveness, don't do any kind of body scan. Don't do any kind of thing at the beginning of that. Don't ever put this in your mind if you've been practicing that way before, because your mind is learning this new thing of just watching mind and you don't want to confuse your mind. So you just have to keep letting that go and just come back to what you were watching. And then what happens? Tell me what happens. Tell me what happens then. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, like I can feel the like uh, uh, fluctuations in the mind. Like in, I see some like uh, image of some person which flickering very fast. So, mm -hmm. uh, like after that, the mind become uh, cold. But uh, still in that stage, I can feel my body. I mean, I can, if I uh, keep my attention on uh, body, so I can still able to feel uh, that, uh, my body. So, I mean, uh, it is absolutely necessary, like uh, body dissolution is... Uh, oh, see, uh, I think what you are saying, I can kind of uh, relate to you. Uh, see, when you are putting your attention on, on a body part, say if you put an attention on a hand, you will feel that there is a hand, okay? So, your putting your attention on that uh, is the uh, kind of uh, reason where you are feeling it. That uh, that time, uh, 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 that is the reason uh, what uh, Sister Kema was just uh, now saying is, don't do that. Don't put your attention on anything other than your object of meditation okay if your mind is very calm and you are going into the aruba states even then uh, say if a fly lines on your uh, hand or something like that you will feel that uh, because your attention goes there and that uh, sensation is there but once you don't put the attention then you will not feel the body so that is what uh, she's trying to say is that you do not do the uh, and you leave all your old habitual tendencies which was about the uh, scanning of the body and uh, those kind of things can take uh, time, but uh, you have to uh, kind of be sure that your attention is there on whatever uh, is currently your object of meditation. Okay. 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 Thank, thank you, Bhante Thank you. Thank you, sister. Yeah. Okay. Jeez. <laughs> <Some message>. fun. <laughs> no, I was having fun. I, never mind. I'm sorry. <laughs> I get like that sometimes, you know. <laughs> okay, so anybody else have any questions? We're open for questions. We should have a big question day, but they can't come unless they have a question. <laughs> we need we need a lot of questions. Hmm. that's the best cat i'm telling you that's the best cat <laughs> look at that cat's been with her the whole time i can't believe it does she meditate with you too will she meditate yes in a word she will 
we have somebody coming to the retreat who has her dog and she can't come unless she brings her dog, but her dog meditates too. <laughs> I'm, I am waiting to see how this works with the, with the meditation center. I am fascinated. <laughs> I can't wait. So I don't know what kind of dog this is, but, but she assured me this dog will meditate on her command. We'll just be quiet. Wow. And be there. <laughs> I'm going to, it gives me great hope for the animal world. <laughs> I'll tell you, you know, this is cool. Okay. So are we, are we okay here? We're done. Yeah. Well, this was pretty interesting. Now we need to um, have you guys uh, write in requests for next Sunday. Um, see how that goes. We had um, a delay again in a test. I have to wait till August 4th to have this test done. It was supposed to done this morning. And I think we're doing, we're still doing a, uh, I think we're still doing a biopsy on, on Friday. I love these people. They just keep going and going and going. <laughs> I just look. They are also we are gonna... uh, hmm? yeah. they are persistent. They want to be accurate. So that's good. Well, huh? That's the most important part is they want to be really accurate so that when they go like, boom, like that, they hit the target. <laughs> you know, I, I can really appreciate this because it, the primary is so small, uh, you know, where we're talking about. And they're going to find it inside the um, the nodes. That's where they're going to find it. So let's see what they decide to do. And uh, so everybody, let's say a prayer and we'll sign off. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, the devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Ding, ding. Thank you, sister. Thank you very much.